was like, I tried to watch a precept thing. And I was like, A, that's cute that she's watching it. B, you can come be live in the room. Um, and C, thanks for telling me that there was no sound. And because Trey was able to come up here yesterday and play with a few things and um, figure it out what was going on. So, um, hopefully after today, if you go back and watch the video, there'll be sound. If you're great at lip reading, maybe not the last two. I'm terrible at lip reading. Okay, um, we only have one chapter to, to um, go over today, but um, wow, was there a lot of cross-references? And it was confusing. Okay, well, we'll work through things. I, I agree. The language in here. Hey, while I'm thinking of it, I'm going to um, give you a little hit. Last week and this week, um, Kay Arthur's son did the teaching on the video. And when he was reading the scripture, I was like, that's a little different. He's using um, the ESV, the English Standard Version. Um, Precepts is also doing materials in the English Standard Version because it is also an equally good word-for-word -word translation. Um, What's cool about the ESV, and when you read um, 2 Corinthians, it's a little more like the NIV, a little more reader-friendly, a little more, um, the sentence structure is a little more reader-friendly to our ears. It's a little bit updated. So if you are ever, like, I, I can't think of a verse right off the top of my head, but there's a couple verses where I read it, and I'm like, what's he saying? And if I just open up the ESV, it can, it, not 100%, but a lot of times it can help. So that's a helpful hint. So if that's kind of, do you have it? No. Yeah, and it can speak, right. So, right, so the New Adaptive Study Bible is in the NASB, which is what our workbook materials are in. But they also have started doing materials in the ESV. And I believe there's a New Adaptive Study Bible in the ESV. Um, now I'm going to have to wrestle with whether we change over because I've got this lovely Bible here with all my marks. And it would, yeah, it would be hard, but it is an easier to read version. So I'm just using it as another resource. Like I say, when I get stuck, sometimes I'll open the ESP and it's helpful. Okay, so there's that. Thank you for saying you're confused. I'm not saying that will fix all issues, but it certainly helps. Okay, so. Corinthians, let's go back to the beginning. Let's fly together through some review. Um, and let's talk first. What do you know from chapter 1 and chapter 2 about Paul and Timothy? What do you know about the Corinthians? What do you know about their relationship? What do you know about why this letter was written? So, all the questions, all at once. How would you answer that? What do you know? <laughs> He has a very close relationship with him because he was with him for a year and a half when he established the church. Perfect. You got lots of details in that. He established it. He was there for a year and a half. It's a close relationship. Yes. So Paul, obviously an apostle. Timothy accompanying him. Corinthians being the church. What else do you know? The, the church is questioning some of the stuff he's taught them. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not everybody. I would agree with that. But then, one very vocal person. Yes. I mean, some people think there is a person that literally on a trip when Paul was there challenged him to his face, and it was a very contentious moment. Um, so we know some. There's reason to believe, based on Chapter 3 and our study of that, that um, perhaps there was some false teaching going on. So, yeah, there have been some questions raised about who is this Paul, um, is he qualified to teach us? Is he the real deal? All that stuff. Okay, chapter one, and I've already referred to it really quickly. Um, let's just talk about big ideas in chapter one. If you look at chapter one, verses one to 11, what's a repeated thought or phrase? Comfort, yes. Comfort as a result of when are you comforted, when you suffer. So suffering, affliction, and comfort. Um, so he does a lot of teaching on that. What's the big idea on the teaching there? What does he say? Big idea. I've got third, so you can do. Bingo. Right? I'm suffering you do for the kingdom of God makes you grow in your faith. Ooh, yeah, suffering you do for the kingdom of God helps you grow in your faith, right? And you will always receive comfort. 
And you receive comfort so you can share that comfort with other people. So like I said, and you know, our prayer request, I've been through this, I could help you if you go through that too. Let me tell you what helped me. Let me tell you how God was present for me. And let me encourage you in the midst of it. Okay, that's a big idea there. The second half of chapter one, what is he addressing? It's very different. His change of plans. What were his plans? To go visit them. On the way home. On the way, well, on the way, yes. I understand what you're saying about on the way home. Up on his way to Macedonia. I should maybe do it this way for you guys. On his way to Macedonia, right? Um, he stopped on his way to Macedonia, visited them. His plan was on the way back as he went to Judea to stop. That's the trip he didn't stop and make. Wow. Because he thought he'd stir up again. Yeah, he's like, I, I wanted to spare you the contentiousness, um, the pain. It was hard the first time. I don't want to repeat it. And his, his defense is, I'm not fickle. Because I think that's what they were accusing him of. We can't count on you. He's like, actually, I'm not fickle. Actually, I love you. And we're thinking about your needs first and decided not to come and visit at this time. And we last week talked through, was there some sin? Was there some stuff going on in the church that he was kind of hoping, if I don't visit now, maybe they'll get their act together? <laughs> so when I go back, I don't have to address that, um, that they can take care of it on their own. So... That was the second half of the letter. Now, chapter 2 also continues the thought about his visit um, and why he's not visiting. Um, also in chapter 2, I want to just point out verses 5 to 8, because there's a little situation he addresses in verses 5 to 8 of chapter 2. That's important to keep in mind. What is he saying in that, those verses? Give the guy that was probably stirring things up as he's come back repentant. Yes. Yes. So there has been some, and you know, could it be the guy from chapter 5 of First Corinthians? Maybe. Could it be someone else? Maybe. But there's someone that the church is disciplining. Probably. Right. And clearly he's repentant because Paul's saying, bring him back in. Reaffirm your love for him. If you don't, this is verse 11, you, you have the chance of giving Satan a foothold. Whether it's that man's bitterness, whether it's their arrogance, you know, there's a lot of ways Satan could use that situation for evil. And so he said, I need you to finish this process well. Okay, um, end of chapter 2. Let's look at verse 17, and then we will move right into chapter 3. Um, chapter 2, verse 17 this is Paul's last word of this chapter. He says, For we, Paul and Timothy, are not like many. We don't peddle the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. What is Paul saying about his ministry there? He does it out of his faith and love, not for what he's going to get out of that. Okay. So it seems in those days that there were people that would come teach the church and peddle their their message what's peddling me <laughs> yeah for personal gain doing something for personal is that my earring maybe i think that's my earring i'm gonna take this earring so keep hearing it is it for personal pride is you hearing it too okay i'm taking it off huh personal gain yes yeah yeah, yeah. right and so paul as gina just said said i am not that I'm sincere, I'm doing this for God, from God, for God, and I'm speaking the words of Christ. Why do I bring that up? Well, again, it kind of builds that idea that this is a church that has not only heard from Paul. Think back to 1 Corinthians. Who else has preached in this church? His name starts with A. Apollos. Apollos. Right? So Apollos has been there and ministered. Now Apollos seems like he was preaching the gospel in its entirety correctly after Priscilla and Aquila like helped bring him along. But so he did things for the right reason. Okay. Um, if you read verse 17, one could read behind between the lines and go, wow, have others shown up at this church 
and said, hey, if you pay my room and board and an extra hundred dollars a week, I'm going to come and teach you some really cool stuff about God. Possibly. So possibly and probably yes. And so that's the other side. Are there then some false teachings going on? Keep that idea in mind as we go through chapter 3 and we look at what Paul hits pretty hard. Um, I think there's some false teaching going on. And it has come because some people have peddled their ministry. Okay. Let's go now to we're ready for chapter 3. Let's do the hard part first. Did any of you come up with a theme for the chapter, a title for the chapter? <clears throat> what did you say? Confusion. Confusion. Did you write that in your Bible? <laughs> what, what, did anyone come up with that? Mm. Okay. Let's, let's, let's talk through. I'm going to give it to you if, you if you guys haven't thought of one yourselves yet. Um, but we'll work our way through. We'll, we'll talk about it in the end. So. I'm saying the answer was adequacy of ministry. Ooh, I like that. Adequacy is a big repeated word. You don't know what it means. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's, let's read. We'll read verses 1 to 3, and then, and then we'll work on this. Huh? You have it written in your Bible there. Epist. Yes. 
still have a bunch of toys. So. Well, and he did that, right? Because it says that, you know, after he went and after he was discipled, I can't remember the Ananias, I think was the gentleman's name, that he went and stayed with. Then he went and met with the apostles at that time and got them to confirm his missionary journeys. Okay, they aren't bad, but he's getting ready to make a point about what really proves the legitimacy of someone's ministry. Is it a letter that proves that I'm legitimately a teacher of the gospel, or is there something else? So look at verse 2, because I think he's like, let's think deeper here, church. What does he say? What is his letter of recommendation? It is? I was hard to Is it written in your heart? It's, yeah, you, who's you in verse 2? The, the Corinthian church. You church, you church are what? The only thing I need, Paul says, when I go to another church is you and the proof of you and the knowledge of you. You are my letter of recommendation. Okay? All right. Why can he say that? Well, let's talk about this. Your letter, where is the letter written? In his heart. Okay, so here's his heart. <laughs> So that letter has been written in his heart. Okay, let's keep going. Who can know and read it? All men. All men with eyeballs, right, can look here and go, there's a letter written. The, the, the recommendation that Paul's gospel and his ministry is true is the fact that that church in Corinth is fun functioning and representing the gospel well. It, it's written within Paul. Let's go on verse 3. More details about this letter. Okay. Being manifested that you, church, are a letter of who? Yeah. So you represent Jesus. The spirit of the living God. Yeah. The spirit of the living God. This is the letter of Christ, um, cared for us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Okay, let's get the rest of this. That letter isn't written with ink, but it's written with what? Mm -hmm. He says specifically, not written with ink, but written with the spirit, the spirit of God. Okay. What point is he making? Is he literally telling us that if you open up his chest, there's a little letter written there, and, and the Holy Spirit wrote us, wrote it? Is, is that what he's saying? If you want to say no, you're right. <laughs> right, it's a deeper message. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. I like what Heather just said. Their actions, how they are living out the gospel, prove the legitimacy of his apostleship. Yes, they're witnessing. Oh, I gotta flip my flip my notes to these side because I knew I had this great sentence written and I didn't write it. The true credential of ministry is change lives. It doesn't matter how many precepts courses I've been to, how big my class gets, how little my class gets. It doesn't matter how many PhDs or degrees any pastor at this place or Sunday school teacher has, how big or little their class is. The greatest proof of their ministry and their calling is our people's lives changed. Is there a, it's in the, that's, yeah, is there a legacy of people that walk in and say, I've been changed and it lasted in my life? It's not how energetic is the worship service, how much jumping are we doing? I mean, that can matter, but at the end of the day, does it have a lasting transformational effect? Am I speaking the same gospel now that I spoke 20 years ago? Is it making a difference? That's the true credentials. Um, and that's what he's saying here. And it's, it's a challenge for the church at work. You know, are you living it? It's a challenge for him as well. Huh? So that's what those first three verses are about. The question for us then is, is the same true for you? The people that you have been a steward of, kids, grandkids, class, the people that you've taught, people you've shared the gospel with, um, can they look at your life and see the change? And then do you lead people with, I don't change lives, but I can lead people to the Holy Spirit. You can't change lives, 
but you can lead people there and walk with them in that process. So there's a little challenge in there. Let's keep moving forward. Are we good with those verses? Okay, I think that's what Paul's saying. Okay, let's go to verses 4 to 6. There's going to be another key repeated word in here, and it's a different repeated word. <clears throat> Here's, it's, it's Blanche's key repeated yes. word, right? Okay. He says, and such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I'm, I'm with you, Blanche. If you just read that through, boom, boom, you're like, what is going on? Right? But what's a key repeated word? Adequate. Adequate. There's also confident. You, you marked confident in this chapter as well. Um, but let's talk about what is he saying about adequacy. Okay. Let's start in verse 5. <clears throat> no, 4. Confidence. Paul is a confident man. Why is he confident according to verse 4? He makes it really clear. Because of Christ. Not because he's awesome. In fact, we've heard some things that actually say his public speaking skills were not awesome. Right? But he's like, but I'm still confident because of Christ. Now move forward. Verse 5. He says, not that we are adequate in ourselves. What's he saying there? <laughs> That's okay. Don't rely on your own self, right? He's like, Again, he's kind of restating it. I can be confident, but I know that I didn't produce adequacy in myself. I didn't make myself good enough. Because you reminded us along in the beginning. What was he just a few years ago? A Pharisee killing Christians, right? And he's like, I didn't just make myself really good. That came from God. And that's what he's saying there. He's like, I'm not adequate. We, he includes Timothy in that. We are not adequate in ourselves to consider is anything coming from ourselves. Our adequacy is from God. So he's now saying, and it's kind of what I said at the end of what I said, um, any transformation that happens in that church is from God, ultimately. He was obedient. He was used by God. But he doesn't make, I don't make Blanche adequate, Mom adequate, Crystal adequate. Like That's you and God together. I played my part, and I can be confident that Paul's confident in the part that he played, but the adequacy comes from God. And then he lands to where we're going to land, verse 6. He says, it's, it's God that made me adequate to preach this gospel or new covenant. And he's like, I'm not preaching of the letter. I'm preaching of the spirit. And then he starts our next big thought. He says, the letter does what? But the what does what? I already have it written up there. letter kills and the spirit gives. Okay, giant contrast starts right here, doesn't it? But I'm still hung up on the adequate. Why do you hang up about that? Us is adequate as service. Does that mean that we're adequately on our way as being service, or we are adequate because we're listening to it? Yes and yes. Can I say oh. yes to both? Well, that doesn't help. <clears throat> well, I think it does. I mean, so think of Paul being the gift of an apostle. Think of who Paul was before, right? God made him adequate in God's eyes. Jesus died for his sins and made so there's great transformation. Right. So there's that adequacy. I don't earn my salvation, you don't earn your salvation, right? So we can use that word adequate there. God makes me adequate. But then he talks about his ministry. I think of the word my God's going to supply all my needs. And I think it's that idea. God makes it possible at all for Paul to do what he does. That makes, I think it's just that simple. Uh, the ESB says sufficient. Exactly. Yeah, I like the word sufficient. It says sufficient. sufficient. <clears throat> so you may think you need to be a big, huge evangelist like a Billy Graham or something. God says you're adequate for what I've got for you to do. Yeah. And that's what he did with Paul. You're adequate. Paul was well, but he says I was the greatest sinner of all. I mean, that's what Paul says. Paul says I was the, the grandest sinner of all, right? And, and that's also something that's being attacked in Paul, that he isn't a good enough apostle. 
So I think this is also building his argument that actually the proof that I am an adequate apostle is the fact that many people in Corinth are now Christians and this church exists. But God made that possible. God made, made us, me sufficient to be able to carry that out. Make better sense? Maybe put that word sufficient in there for you. All right. I think the word adequate also means that adequate means that we all are adequate. Does it put anybody above you? Mm. I like that. I like that. We don't like that word as Americans, adequate. But, like. but it's more <laughs> what God has intended you to do. If you're trying to right. do your step and everything else because you think you want to be, God says, I put you where you are. Feel that. Yeah, and I will make, I will. You're, well, yeah, I'll give you Adequate to me it sounds like that he has given us so many gifts. But we're not using them because we're just adequate. No, no. no. <laughs> I think the context here is adequate's a good thing. Adequate's like a sufficient. Adequate's like I'm good enough. Yeah, he's like at three verse five. Not that we're good enough in and of ourselves to consider that we're producing good things. The reason I'm good enough is because I serve God. It's also God made me good enough to be a servant of the of the new covenant. Does that make better sense too? Okay, I would read it that way. Okay, sufficient, good enough. God, God did that. I would say to put people in in their place. But yeah. So that you don't think that you're better, or you can do, you know, that you're better than anyone else. Well, I mean, think back to First Corinthians. First Corinthians is is a book where people thought that if you were really wise, right? That, that if you were human, you were greater than everybody else. And Paul actually makes the point that human wisdom is foolishness in God's eyes. And I think it's playing on all of that as well. Is anything we are able to do, it comes from God. It's his spirit. Yeah, there. That's what I think he's saying right there. Spirit is the one that So, yes. Yes. He's living proof and they are living proof. Yes. So, verse 6. Let's start our contrast. Ready? Um, verse 6, he starts talking about the letter and the spirit. So in verse 6, I started a little chart up here. We're going to do verse 6, and then we're going to work our way through verse 11. But in verse 6, what can we put over here under the letter? What do you learn about the letter? The letter is what? Okay, now obviously he's taking the word letter. He's no longer talking about letters of commendation. Now he's talking about a different letter. Yes, okay. He says, the letter kills, but the spirit does what? Gives life. Gives life. Gives life. Okay. Now, I'm going to read verses 7 to 11, and then we're going to come back to our chart, and we're going to fill it out. Okay. It says, but if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Sure. For if the, if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, in this case, has no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Okay, we'll talk about glory in a moment. So hold on to your thoughts about glory. Let's just get up here the essentials and make sure that we um, sort out language that's being used. Go back to verse 7. Verse 7 says, ministry of death. How the ministry of death comes, the very next phrase. In letters, the ministry of death was in letters engraved on. So the ministry of death is over here. Huh? So that's the law. Yeah. It's in reference to the taking of death. Yes. You guys have jumped way ahead. There you go. <laughs> well, it's just trying to understand. Okay. That's fine. That's where we're going to be very organized in our thinking and going forward. It's going to work really well. Okay. So, let's, that's the ministry of death, engraved carved on stones. Verse 7, what else do you learn about this ministry of death? In letters engraved on stones, it came with what? Okay. But it tells you something about that glory. Okay, that glory faded. It fades and faded. I'm going to fade. Okay, so that's what verse 7 
tells us about that letter. It's a ministry of death. It was engraved on stones. It came with glory, but that glory fades away. Go down to verse 9. Let's also get something up here under letter. Um, what phrase in verse 9 describes this letter? It's another ministry. Ministry of what? Okay. Anything else from verse 5 we should get up here about this letter? I don't think so. I think we hit that. It just repeats the fact that it has glory. Okay. Um, let's go back now and let's contrast it with the other side. Go back up to verse 8. Okay. Verse 8, this is called the ministry of the Spirit, right? What else do you learn about that ministry of Spirit as it concerns glory? Okay. It has more glory than what? It came with more glory. More glory than what? More glory than that. I'm just going to draw an arrow back, right? So we're in verse 9. It says, the ministry of condemnation has glory. Oh, wait. Yeah. Okay. So the ministry, sorry, 8. The ministry of the Spirit would not fail to be even more with glory. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of what? have more glory. Okay. So this one has more glory than this one, but this came with glory. Alright. That's really clear. We're trying to make Paul's words clear here. It's his sentence structure that makes some of this really hard. Fail to be even more. Right. It has more glory. It does. Well, let's read verse 10 because 10 is going to repeat that exact same thought because Paul's repetitive. <laughs> for, for indeed, what had glory? Which one of these two things had glory? Past tense. Right, because it's faded, right? So he said, This had glory. This is verse 10. For indeed, what had glory? In this case, I think that's saying because this came, right? So the law had glory, but because the new covenant came, now this has what? In comparison, no glory. And what about the glory of this one? Yeah. Surpasses. I'm going to say old C, old, old, old covenant. Okay. So what is the ministry of condemnation? That's the that's the letter. We're going to talk about it in a minute. We'll talk about why that's true. Okay, let's get verse 11. Let's make sure we understand it, and then we'll keep going forward. He says, if that which fades away, what fight fades away? Which one of these? Yeah, so this is called that which fades away. Which is the ministry of death. Right? The letter. Okay, this is also called that which fades away. This is verse 11. For that which fades away was with glory. Another repeated idea. Make sure you know it came with glory. Much more, that which remains is in glory. So over here, the spirit, it remains. Okay. It's permanent. Yes, I like that. It's permanent. That's from the ESV, sorry. No, that's fine. The ESV is legal now in this room. <laughs> I mean, nothing's been illegal, but it's okay. We just got, I just wanted us to get really concrete what were what was in those verses. Because again, I'm with you. I had to read that over and over and over and make sure I got that sentence structure all correct. But you see what's going on here. Now, let's talk about, let's go back up to verse 7. Um, verse 7. On the left, the, lit, the letter, what do we call this? What do you and I call this? Law. Law. Some of us call it also the Old Covenant. Who was it given to? Okay, so no question, right? Oh, man, I need another black pen. Okay, I'll give it. Give it to Moses. Okay, so, um, hold on, I'm going to grab it. I know there's a blue back here, but it works. Okay. So we know that the left is the Old Covenant and the law. We've got that under our belt. Meaning that on the left, what do we call this? The new covenant. Oh, good grief. The tip is... 
<laughs> Just when I think I've made all provisions for pens, I have something that falls apart. Okay, we'll make this work. Yes, and the door's open too, Sarah, if you're willing. And oh, wait, 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 Sarah, before you run, I just found these. Uh, okay, good, bingo, you don't have to run. I don't want you to end up with your knee anyways. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, let's do one more thing before we move on to. Let's get this word glory under our belt because it is all over the place. Because you've got to ask yourself, why does Paul keep using the word glory? And he says, this had glory, but its glory went away, so now it has generally no glory because this glory surpasses and it remains. What on earth is glory? Glory in the Greek is, I believe, D-O-X-A. I think that's right. Yes, I was right. What is glory? Y'all were supposed to look that up. What does glory mean? Well, yes. <laughs> anyone? 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 Radiance. Something that's shiny. Let me make sure I get my, get my words right. Something that's bright, brightness, splendor. These are like cruise ship names. What'd you say? <laughs> Sorry. Is that you that said it? What'd you say? These are like cruise ship names. Oh, are they? You're right. That's the Royal Caribbean, right? <laughs> yes. Radiance of the sea, splendor of the seas. You're right. Glory of the seas. I don't think that's a quote. Another definition of glory that's related but a little bit different is. Um, an estimate or something that gives a good opinion of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Now, go back to, I believe it's verse 7 where it talks about Moses. Let's apply this word. Yeah. Okay. So, verse 7 said this, the letter right here, the law, was given with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because what? Because so what was Moses' face had glory? Use this definition. What was Moses' face doing? I, I, yeah, I don't know what this means. It was bright and shiny. Right? Because he was with he was with God. God spoke to him. This is where you can bring in this definition of. His face was simply reflecting who God is. Right? Yes. Splendor. Amazing. Okay. But Paul says, and he acts like a commentator on the Old Testament, and he's like, it's not just that Moses' face was bright and shiny, so it hurt their eyes. Did you catch from verse 7, and as you did your work, what was it about the glory that the veil then hid? What happened to the glory? Faded. And Paul makes the point that that veil was something that prevented the Israelites from seeing that the glory didn't stick. And Paul's saying, the old covenant is like that. It had glory, it shone, I'm gonna take, the, I'm gonna take a jump, it correctly reflected who God was to the Israelites, but something about this law faded. It wasn't adequate in the long haul. There's something about this covenant that its glory, its splendor, its opinion of who God is, it reflects God, it remains. It doesn't ever fade. It stays. It's within you. He started the chapter out talking about that. He needs this church to understand these distinctions. And I think we as a church have got to understand the distinctions as well. So that's a good little starting point. We're going to go on. We're going to read verses 12 to 18. It has a little more to say about that. Um, we're going to finish this chapter out, and then we're going to go back and work our way through a whole bunch of cross-references. We're going to go through the book of Exodus super fast. We can do it. Okay, verses 12 to 18, listen for the word veil, because veil's going to come jump in now. And we're going to learn. I kind of just said it, but you're going to hear it from Paul. It says, so starting in verse 12, having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. Remember, he's bookending this with his idea that um, that Corinthian church is the letter that they need, that they are a reflection of uh, Paul's adequacy as an apostle. So he says, 
I have a hope in that New Testament so I can be bold. Okay, verse 13. I'm not like Moses. We aren't. Me and Timothy aren't like Moses. And what did Moses do? Who used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Hmm. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, when he says whenever Moses is read, what does he refer to? The, the, yeah, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, right? So whenever those books are read in synagogue, a veil lies over their hearts. Heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty or freedom, some of your versions might say. But we all, church, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Okay. Let's go back to the veil. Who uses it according to like verse 13? Okay. Hey, he's the first instance of it. And we already have said it. Why does Moses put the veil on it? It says in verse 13. Well, right. But actually, verse 13, it's different. To keep people from seeing the fading glory. So Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. So they didn't realize that Moses' shiny face was fading. Why? Because he covered it. And you go, why, why, why did God not want them to see that? Why did Moses not want them to see it? Because back then, the freedom of speech, and to, and to show what's in your heart, mm -hmm. he, he yes. just could have hurt you or could have... He didn't want them to think that the law something that was going to fade away. Yeah, like, wasn't it a protection of the integrity of the law? Yeah, he yeah. wanted them, he didn't want them to think that it was a fading thing. Hmm. It was a, at that time, a lasting thing, but yeah. not permanent. It was never meant to be permanent. Right. But it's there's some right. stuff that was hidden. The gospel wasn't revealed in its fullness at that time, right? Right. So it's still a mystery, and, and Paul writes that, that, that the gospel's a bit of a mystery that doesn't get revealed until Jesus' resurrection. So I'm kind of with you. Is he protecting them from the fact that, I like it, lasts, it's valid, the law is valid, it's not bad, it came with glory, it correctly represented who God was, it just wasn't the permanent thing, this is. So is it a protection from the Israelites? I mean, I, I don't know. It's just an interesting thought. But let's move forward because now he uses the word veil. And according to verse 14, it's not just Moses who has a veil. Who else has a veil? According to verse 14 and 15 and 16, who else? It's not a literal veil, but who else has a veil? Specifically who? Israelites, I think here he's being very specific to the Israelites. Can we generalize to any non-Christian? Sure. But he's being pretty specific here. When the Jews in Paul's day sat in synagogue and the laws read, what's going on in their hearts? They, they, they hide their hearts. They're hiding they, that veil protects them and hides their heart, doesn't let that the old covenant covenant, what they really know and love, they, they, they don't want to show it to other people in a sense. They only want to show it to each other maybe a little bit. It's the way it so no, I like what you have to say in that the, 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 there's kind of a hiding going on within them. They, they, they don't want to recognize that what they have spent their whole life studying and believing in that's right. that it has changed is being changed to this new has world. been eclipsed by this. Right. Because Paul just said, because so this has so much glory, to it. this has none anymore. Because you know, they've spent their whole lives. That's yes. what they have done. Yes. That's what and Paul can say that because he lived it. Well, they couldn't yes. do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't, they couldn't do, do it. it. We're we'll talking about, about that in a moment. Their, mind. their minds are closed. Yeah, so they they could just said their minds are closed. They couldn't do it. Harden their heart against yeah. that because 
I'm doing it great. I can do it for me. This is what I've always been taught. Yes. yes. But here's what's interesting to me. Okay? I think everything that you guys are saying is true. I think you're you're building the totality of what's going on. But this is interesting. Um, verse 16. What's the only thing that takes the veil away? Christ. Christ. The Holy Spirit. You know what's interesting about that? It's a spiritual battle. It's not... Because some of us can sometimes talk about those Jews as like, they just refuse to see truth. Yes, but... There's almost like a spiritual thing going on where they can't see truth. It does require a turning to Christ. So they can turn to Christ. And when they turn to Christ, that veil comes off. So think about Paul on that road to Damascus. He was, he was veiled. He couldn't see the truth of who Christ was. Christ appears. He could have turned away from Christ and run the other direction. But he turned, and when he turned, all of a sudden he had this understanding. It's a spiritual thing. And I think even then, for me, there's some mystery in that process. But um, I think it's helpful for you and I, with Jewish friends, it can build compassion toward them to go, this is a spiritual battle. It isn't just that they haven't heard a good enough argument. You can't argue a Jew or many other people to God. All you can do is show Christ and help them turn toward him, right? That, that is, there is actually a veil. There is something that just, when you sense it, feel like, why don't they get it? There's a veil. And, and only God and only the turning to Christ changes that. So, okay. Verse 18. Who has an unveiled face, according to verse 18? All believers. Yeah, believers have an unveiled face. And as such, we can look in a mirror, right, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. And that's interesting. I read this, uh, and it's interesting. Their mirrors back then were not very good. <laughs> you ever seen a really bad mirror? Pretty fuzzy. I think that's what he's saying there. He's like, we can understand some of the glory of God, but not the totality of it. I mean, I think we're still looking at a glass dimly. Right? We don't have all knowledge of everything they says, but we can still see way more than the Jews can, right? We can see the glory of God, and we are being transformed. We're growing in that. Okay. That's verses 12 to 18. You feel pretty good about that? We just, like, ran through that scripture. Okay. We're going to go back to Exodus because then here are questions that I have. These are Denise's questions. Can I get an You can. Trying on our own, yeah. 
and Christ's sufficiency for our salvation. I think you're right. He is teaching us something about us and our inability to save ourselves and, and pointing us toward how miraculous and amazing this gift is. Sarah. I was just going to say, he also speaks to God being us what we are. I mean, he gave them the law they were coming out of Egypt. Yeah. And so some of that may have just been to, to move it along. I don't know that if we, if I knew some things I was going to have to go through as an adult, as a kid, it would have been very scary that God moved me along to those things. The, the idea of God meeting us where we're at right. is huge in that too. Yeah, well, let's go back and let's review. We are not going to read all this because y'all were supposed to. But um, let's go all the way back to Exodus 19. Um, and we're going to review what the Old Testament tells us about Moses, tells us about the hail, tells us about glory. The first place is Exodus 19. I am not going to read it all to you. Um, but we are going to talk about what Exodus 19, and you just looked at verses 1 to 8. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. I'm going to put us in time. The first one is Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gotten out of the land of Egypt, on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Verse 3, Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Tell the sons of Israel, um, verse 4, you've seen what I did for them. Um, Verse 6, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Verse 7, Moses comes down, calls all the people, tells them what the Lord said. In verse 8, the people say, what the Lord has said. Okay, so where is Israel? What is God doing? So where is Israel? Just, okay, to Sarah's point, what have they just been through? For 400 plus years. And a mass killing of all young boys, chances are most mamas have lost a son and had a son killed, right? Right? So genocide, right? And they've escaped and almost been caught at the Red Sea, right? Okay, they've been through all that. Um, what do you see Moses doing? What do you see Moses' job in this? What do you see him doing? Mediator. He's going between the people and God. God's choosing to speak to him, right? And then he'll share what, he, what God says with the people. Okay, what do you see? What's God doing? He's giving the people free will. He is giving them free will because what's he put before them? A choice. He's giving them the choice of to? To, to turn towards me or not. Okay, and to turn towards him means they must do what? How do, how do they show they're turning toward God? Accepting what? This. So, here's the choice. He's, he's going to give them the law. Follow this. If you follow this, you're, you're my priest. You're holy. I will be with you. And the people said, we're going to do it. Because we love you and we've seen you do it. Valid, right? Important moment in history. Okay, that's Exodus 19. Now go to Exodus 20. Close page. <clears throat> if you look at Exodus 20 and just glance at it, what do you see? Ten commandments. Who receives them? Moses. Moses, and then he shares it with the people, right? Go all the way to, I like verses um, 19 through 21. I, I like this intersection of Moses and the people. Because Paul talks about it, I want to make sure we catch it. Um, the people say to Moses... Speak to us yourself and we'll listen, but let not God speak to us lest we do what? Uh, why? Why do they think that? Do you think it's just because the rules or is there something else they see about God? The word is awesome. Okay, look at 18. 18 is a clue too. Yeah. But 18, the beginning of 18, all the people perceived what? Thunder, lightning, sound of a trumpet, mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, what was their physical response? Okay. I believe it's just for glory. That too is God's glory. That's a representation of who God is. That's a correct estimation of who God is. The sounds, the lights, that's coming from God. Okay, that's some of God's glory. And the people go, yes sir. 
is a physical fear yes. that they have in yes. this world yes. mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. It's a good fear. I, I would say the fear is a result of what they're seeing and his glory. Like for, for right now. What? Well, yeah, they're experiencing that. I mean, yes, they've also seen him hurt the Red Sea. They've also heard that he's killed along the curse of one of the Egyptians. Oh, and much, much more. And much, much more. Right. History ahead of that, which is just passed down. I'm comfortable saying all those things are part of God's glory. Yeah, but you can't it's blame them. Huh? No, no, you can't blame them. No, you can't blame them. No. no. Because you've got to consider where they've been. Yes. And where they are now. And where they think that they're going to go. I, I, yes. And I agree with you 100%, Leslie. And that's why I'm, I'm building here. Is, is God's doing something very real. And their reactions are very heartfelt and appropriate to the situation. Right? I'm going to have the same thing. It's interesting they say, okay, Moses, we can't handle God speaking to us. You speak to us. And Moses says, verse 21, don't be afraid. God has come in order to test you in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. Part of a result of glory should be, I don't want to sin. Because what I just saw is so majestic, in this case scary, that I want to be on the good side of that. Right? I want to honor that. Um, verse 21, the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. What do you see Moses doing? Why can Moses go see God? Why isn't Moses in the I'm terrified camp? He's been friends with him. He's been chosen. And where God brought him? Yeah, you're right. He was. He brought him to them. Yeah. Let's talk to you. Yep. Moses first. Encounter with God was a burning bush. Yep. What did he do? <laughs> Took off his shoes and worshipped. Okay, let's go to 24. Dancing, dancing through Exodus. Moving fast. Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Exodus 24. You looked at all of verses 1 to 18. So the Ten Commandments have already been presented. But in 24, Moses gets called again. This is Point, this is verse one. Um, God says to Moses, "Come up, come up to the Lord. Now bring Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and seventy elders. Worship at a distance, but then you, Moses, come even closer. Um, and then He gives them all the words of the law. That includes the plans for the tabernacle. Um, actually, that's a huge part of what He's going to give him, including fleshing out those ten commandments. Okay." Um, so, go with, that's 24, that's what's happening. In verses 16 to 18, I want to show you more about God's glory. It says, the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. And to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on a mountaintop. Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and Moses saw the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. What do you observe about God's glory? Here it looks like what? Fire. Fire. That is not just a little flame on the top, but it says it looks like the whole top of the mountain is consumed in a flame. That's a huge flame. And it was also, so it was a fire, but also it was also a cloud at different times. And you see, um, you see Moses going into it. Okay. And I don't want to make him mad either. <laughs> yes. So out of this glory, and Moses and God being face to face, comes the fullness of this. I think God's painting us like a, if you like visual things, we've got a pretty strong visual of the fact that the law reflects who God is accurately. All these rules behave, but they still reflect something of God's nature, that he's holy, that he consumes, right? Fire consumes, that he covers in a cloud. Um, it's also a standard in the, if anybody's mm -hmm. ever tried, like mm -hmm. Pharisees tried all the time, um, we can't, we can't. Right? We are going to hit that. We're going to hit that. And that's what, that would be what is scary to us today, is we can't do it. Go for ourselves. We cannot. We cannot. Go forward to, to Exodus 31 and 32. What did the people do? We're not going to read it. 32. What did the people do while Moses is up there? They get tired of waiting. They get tired of waiting. So the very same people that were like, we're terrified of God. 
Let's do what? Let's build another God. Let's make him a nice little cat. Let's make him something small <laughs> that we can control. So that happens. So when Moses comes down the mountain and he has those stones that God wrote, what does Moses do? Throws them down. It, it's a visual representation of what just happened. What just happened? They broke it. He didn't even get to land his feet on the mountain before they broke it. So it tells you, does that have something to do with its fading glory? Maybe, yeah, right? I, I, we're just thinking it through. Okay, that is go to 34. So Moses goes up again. He gets the tablets the second time. God's like, okay, by the way, if you read all this, you were reminded of the fact that God tests Moses by saying, hey, I'll kill them all. Yeah. And we'll start again. And Moses is like, no, no, no. He stands in the gap. Moses is a picture of who? Jesus. You know, asking for mercy for his people. And so we see a little bit. He's not a perfect Jesus, but he's a representation of that. Then we go to 34. And God says, 34, what? God says, bring up two stones like the other ones. I'm going to write on them. Come up to the mountain. He was successful this time. You go to verse 27 of Exodus 34, the Lord says, write down these words, and here's that word, I made a covenant. There you see, the, the law was a covenant with the people. I made a covenant. Um, and now comes the part about the veil. Here we go. Um, go down to um, 32 of Exodus 34, 34, 32. So afterwards, all the sons of Israel came near. He commanded them to do everything the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. So once again, he shares the law. When Moses had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Why? What was his face doing? Yeah, and, and that's in 29 and 30. The skin of his face shown. The skin of his face shown. He's reflecting God's glory to them. But when he's done speaking the law, he puts the veil on. Verse 34, whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak to him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the, men, the sons of Israel, what he commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of his face shone. Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak to him. What's that process? Moses goes in to talk to God. When he does, he gets a radiant face again. And he comes out and immediately says, speaks to them and then puts the veil on. When do they get to see his face without the veil? When it's at its most radiant. And when he's speaking the words of God to them. Because he's correctly giving an opinion of God. He's speaking God's word to them. He's a representation of that. And he puts it on and it fades. Oh, I've never thought about this this hard before in my life. <laughs> about the veil and what is going on and what it teaches us about the law. And how the law was good, I think that's important for us. Sometimes I think that um, us in the present days, the New Testament church can say the Old Testament means nothing. We in this room don't think that because we love studying the Old Testament. But it can be, a lot of churches will say, we just preach the New Testament. And they inadvertently send the message that this doesn't matter, but it does. This came with glory. It reflects who God is. There's something, we need to hear something of it. I personally think it, it shows us, as we've kind of said, the standard of what holiness in God looks like. It tells us how we treat our neighborhood, our neighbors should be holy, how we treat ourselves. But it's also establishing a, a society. Yes. This was so that this society could correctly rule themselves, right? Yeah. Right. It's a standard. It's a standard. Right. It's a standard. right. It's a standard. right. Okay. Slavery and no, they just knew what they couldn't do. Right. Sure. This is how to get along and friends, right? <laughs> okay, go to Deuteronomy 27. This is interesting. Y'all looked at this in your lesson as well. Deuteronomy 27, 26. This is years later, over 40 years later, right? A new generation of Israelites is getting ready to enter the um, promised land. Moses, before he dies, reiterates this, this letter, this ministry of death, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. This law, this old covenant, and verse 26 is very interesting of Deuteronomy 27. It says, cursed is he who does not perform the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say amen. How do you confirm the words of the law? 
by what? Doing that. In other words, how do you agree that this law is good and right? By doing it. I can give lip service and say, yes, we follow the great and mighty God and this is his law. But if I don't do it, I'm saying with my life that I don't agree with it. I'm not confirming it. And verse 26 six, six says, then you are first word. Cursed. How are you cursed? How are they cursed? When they don't follow the law, how are they cursed? The wages of sin is ultimately death. Ultimately death. So interesting that these are some of the last words. Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And I would add there's other scriptures that talk about doing them all, all the time. Okay. Uh, let's go to Romans 3. Let's talk about what the law does and what the law does not do. And Romans 3 answers the question of why is that called the ministry of death? If it's good, why does it have a title like the ministry of death? It doesn't sound good to us. Romans 3.20. Oh, good truth, good truth. Romans 3.20 says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What do you learn? What? Right, thank you. Why is it important? It gives us what? It's knowledge standards. Gives knowledge of sin. Now. And then it also says, so that is what it does, but what's the negative? What can it never do? It cannot do what? So if I do the works of the law, in other words, if, I, if I'm doing them all, if I say I do them all, this says it still cannot justify, it still can't make me right before, the, before God. Because what is it good for? Giving knowledge of sin. Now flip over, stay in Romans, go to 7. Ooh, this is good. Follow this reasoning. You guys can do it. You guys have your thinking, thinking, thinking hats on. Romans 7, verses 7 to 11. The same author is going to talk some more about sin and the law, okay? And it's going to talk about what the law can do and what the law cannot do. It says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is it sin? Is it? No, may it never be. On the contrary, listen to what it is. I would have not come to know sin except through the law, for I would have not known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. And I once, and I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and it died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Oh. Okay. Let's process through it. So the author of Romans, I'm going to call him Paul, um, says, I read the law. And he picks on a verse, thou shalt not covet. He said, when I read that law, what did it do to him? A couple things. Made him know what coveting was. Made him know what was. And it gave him, he got a correct estimate of God. God is holy, and if God is holy, coveting is wrong because God doesn't covet. He got a correct estimate of God, right? It defined sin. Also, what did it do? It made him want to Why? You ever owned a, a two-year-old? <laughs> Why? Huh? Because it's there. It pointed it out. It like opened up the. It's the knowledge. But it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I think God was like, I don't want you to know it all because then it opens up all those possibilities for us. And your eyes are open, and that two-year-old goes, whoa, cookies? And we go, whoa, I can look at my neighbor and hope I have what they have. And I can maybe come up with a plan to take from them what they have because I want it. I, I have lots of notes in here when I studied it, but it's like, it's like 
sin sits dormant and the law sometimes awakens it and all of a sudden you want to do it just because it's been Or do you think it's now that we recognize it? Oh, I think it's know. both. I can think of it too. I'm going to use a really one. I'm going to use an ugly one, but it, it's one that I think is very true today. Think about pornography. Yeah. The minute any kid becomes aware, hears, you shouldn't look at porn. By the way, it's available there and there and there. Statistics say almost every kid is going to do what? It was dormant. There wasn't knowledge of it. But you point it out, and even though you say don't do it, something, and I'm going to call that, you know, it's, it's what God talks in nature, says, I can go look at that. Don't tell me about that. I can handle that. Or I'm curious. It can be curious. For some, it might be rebelliousness. Everybody's different. Temptation. Temptation. I, I, I think that's the experience, because the author of this isn't like I wanted to covet. He's like, I couldn't help it. The law awakened me to it. So, what is the good that the law does? It tells you what sin is. But also what's bad. So where is sin? I think the author of Romans did a, did a beautiful job of showing it. And he said, because the wages of sin is death, by nature, can you see why it's the ministry of death and condemnation? Just by defining sin for us, opening that awareness, Awakens us, we all then sin. Most of the time, it points out a sin we already do it. Let's be honest, right? For many of us, it's like, oh, I've already been lying, now I realize it's wrong. But for some, it literally opens it up. So, who? There's that truth. There's how it leads to, to, to death. Okay, uh, Galatians 3.10. Let's look at this one last thing. Galatians 3.10. <clears throat> Another retelling of the verse we read in Deuteronomy. And he just, he acts as a commentary on it. He says, Galatians 3.10, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. That's a rewording of what we read in Deuteronomy. And I like the rewording. It says you do it all, right? Um, I like that it says, um, verse 10, for as many as are the works of the law are under a curse. So, you have a choice. And this is all mankind now, right? You can either say, I'm going to get to heaven with this, or I'm going to get to heaven with this. This is called works, right? And I would say most people are like, I can do this. Now, they might not agree with the laws we have written in the Bible, but they're going to say, I'm good enough. There's some law they're living by. There's some works they're trying to attain to get them to heaven. But Galatians 3.10 says, if you're putting yourself under the works of the law, you're also under a what? A curse. Because why? What's the truth of the law? We're going to say it again. Wages sin or death. And if you don't keep it all, all the time, you've broken it. And if you've broken it, you haven't kept it. And if you haven't kept it, you're cursed. That's the truth. Okay, go back to, Denise is going to skip a significant part of the lesson because we are running out of time, but that is fine. Um, go back to Galatians. I'm sorry, Galatians. No, Denise. Go back to 2 Corinthians 3. Let's go revisit our scripture. So, why for this church, why for our church, has Paul just taken the time to flesh this out. What does he need that church to know? What do we need to know? Why does it matter? Huh? Your faith is sufficient for what? What does faith produce in us? What does God say? Faith produces righteousness. Without faith, there's no righteousness. And faith and works are contrary to one another in the system. All right, what else? What do you think Paul wants this church to know? Yes, there is, I mean, 
it, it can feel repetitive to keep studying this over and over and over again, but every time I do, I always thank you. I need to be reminded that there's a new covenant. And I need to live in light of this because it's so easy. Even as a Christian, I can do this number. Thank you, Jesus. I was saved by your work on the cross. Now I'm going to be a really good little girl, and I'm going to retain your good favor by living like this. I can do both functionally in my life. It's not what I ought to do. I think sometimes I go, thank you, Jesus. You died for my sins. I'm going to heaven now, but now I'm going to make God really proud of me, and he's going to bless me because I'm going to keep all his law. And I can blend the two. I think a lot of us tend to do that. And Vicki, I'm with you. We need to be reminded, I can't get God to love me more by going here. It's always, ever, this. Yes. feels like you check a box, though. Yes, we love that. It, we can control it. We're Americans in 2022. We love to control everything, right? And we love not to just control us, but I love to control you. And I love to control my kids, and I love to control my husband, and I want to make sure everyone else lines up with that too. If I can flip all the boxes and look at look what a good job I've done. That's what I'm saying. And I think in this church, in the Corinthian church, they were dealing with some of the same stuff. I mean, Paul doesn't address it, but I think there were probably Jews in there that were like, great, you're saying by Jesus, but also, we need to be circumcised, we need to dress like this, we need to act like this. And Paul is saying, I want, I'm want, i going to use strong language. This kills and leads to death. Only this leads to life. Now, let's close up by talking about the Spirit. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. I want to I wanna, um, close this up here. Um, by 17 and 18. <clears throat> okay. okay. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Go to 18. And you were asked this in your uh, homework. What is the goal? Of, what, is, what is the goal that Paul has for the church? What is the goal that God has for us? It's in verse 18. Transformation. And according to 18, what transforms? Yes. Does the law transform? No. The law is the law. Yes. Right? It's faded. It's good for defining sin and convicting people of sin. Right? And some people just like that little guardrail that you need until you come to Christ. Once you come to Christ, this is what transforms because this it. makes you want to live like that. Yes. There you go. I mean, you can't just take one with you. That one you can't take by itself. But they have to work together. Both of them show us who God is. And I, if I want to reflect him, the laws are going to me. Because people think that mm -hmm. don't blend the two, they, oh, I can, I can, I'm now converted, I can sin, and I right. ask for forgiveness of my sins, and go back and sin again, <laughs> but what this makes you do is, it makes you strive to not continue to do whatever that sin is in your life. I like that, that's, that's, that's well worded, and I want to point out verse 17 and 18, our time is up, but the thing that we didn't really get to um, connect to very well is it says now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty the end of 18 we're transformed just as from the Lord the spirit I do I love this verse I have it as a key it's our last verse we'll look at um, it's Romans 8 29 not because the word predestined is in it y'all so don't get in trouble with the Wesleyan police <laughs> but <laughs> this sometimes can rile some Wesleyans up. I I'm good with this verse. Uh, it's Romans 8:29. I love the promise of this, and I think Paul this I think Paul wrote this, and I think you see his heart. I love it. Okay, Romans 8:29. For whom he foreknew, and that's all of y'all sitting in this room if you've accepted Christ. He knew you would. Okay. For those he foreknew, church, 
He also predestined, I have a note there, he marked out beforehand. He, he wrote the goal of your life. Before you became a Christian, he knew you were going to become a Christian. The goal for your life has been determined. Here's what it is. Whom he called, these he, oh no, no, sorry, don't. He predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What's the lesson plan of your life? What's the goal God wrote for your life? So that you be what? Gradual process of sanctification. Yes, that's good too. Conform to the image of Jesus. Because his son is the best picture of God's glory. It's a perfect representation who God is. And God wants you to, as close to perfect as you can, to be a correct approximation of who God is. The law can inform that. And you're right. The spirit in us, then, you can look at all the verses. The comfort, the spirit of truth within us points us toward what conforms us to be in the image of his son. The end of that verse is saying, then when we are all conformed to the image of his son, it makes his son the firstborn of all of us. Glory to glory. Right. He's that firstborn, perfect, overachiever son in the family. But that's kind of what it's saying. He was the firstborn, and we all follow, and we look like him. That's the goal for all of our lives. Um, I like, Gina, that you said, when you put yourself under here, this kind of informs, right? You're motivated to want to become like that. Okay, we missed a whole bunch of cross-references, but as I was doing this lesson yesterday, I was like, there's no way we did all of it. And that's fine. I think we did a great job of what we did. But any questions, comments before we close it down? Verse 31 of that same chapter. Yeah. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, can be against us. Yeah, and Paul says that too. Like, I can be afflicted, right? I can go through hard times. God is with me if I'm on this process, right? Yeah. Anything else? Good stuff. Okay, Lance, last question. Is it less confusing now? Oh, what's your one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what is it, y'all? I told you I was just going to give it to you. Okay. We, we got the, the beginning of, part of, of chapter 3, right? He talked about letter. They have, you are our letter. In other words, the church is Paul's letter. That's the first part of it. He's like, you're proving the truth of my ministry. Um, and then the second part, I mean, you can put law versus gospel. You can put old versus new covenant. I just put the ministry of the spirit. He didn't talk about the spirit a lot in here, sorry y'all. That was supposed to be a big section of what we talked about, but we didn't. But the ministry of the spirit is this new covenant, so. Like, you are our letter, ministry of the spirit is what precepts had, but any version of that's good. Alright? Alright, thank you guys. That was a pretty good lesson. Grab some more food.